Thank you, Dr. J.B. Bittner, for talking to us today about component separation. Uh, please tell us uh, briefly what, what, uh, how component separation applies to hernia repair. Well, component separation really applies to ventral and incisional hernia repairs, um, and it constitutes a various number of techniques for fascial release that allow mobilization of muscle inner fascia for primary closure of the hernia defect. Um, and there's, there's various strategies that are used to really accomplish that goal, but the end result is to try to get the patient closed in a tension-free manner as safely as possible, and preferably once and not multiple times. Yeah, and, and it seems to be a technique which has evolved quite a bit in the last decade, it seems, like we're using it more than I recall during my training. Sure, it's, it's much more of the last decade for several reasons. I mean, first and foremost, in experienced hands, it's a safe and effective means of closure for complex ventral incisional hernias, and I, I think the data bear that out. When done by an experienced surgeon in appropriately selected patients, and we can get into that, <laughs> um, component separation allows for really more tension-free closure of the hernia defect and better outcomes with regard to hernia recurrence. Mm -hmm. um, also, in an increasing number of patients seek or even require treatment for incisional hernias over time, the baby boomers get older and they have more operations and they get more hernias. So the reason for this is really multifactorial. I mean, various risk factors predisposed to incisional hernias such as morbid obesity and tobacco dependence and surgical site um, infections but also technique of abdominal wall closure at the time of the primary operation impacts the rate of incisional hernias as well. We know some for some really great work by Israel Sun and Milborn and others has shown that it doesn't it's not enough just to fix hernias well, but we also should strive to really prevent them. And there may be some good strategies to do exactly that. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, we should really try to mitigate our, our own patients' risks, especially in the elective setting the smoking cessation and the weight loss and the things that go with poor outcomes are things that we can help change preoperatively and maybe impact ultimately the outcome. Mm -hmm. um, and really also with outcomes, we should enter those outcomes in some prospective database. For me, it's the America's Hernia Society Quality Collaborative, which is a great um, thing to have. It's, uh, it allows for comparison of outcomes, standardization of outcomes, and really longitudinal um, review of of what these component separations really equate to when it comes to outcomes. Yeah, I'm glad to hear we're collecting data on that since it uh, seems to be gaining in popularity. And so who's the ideal candidate for component separation techniques? So really defining the ideal candidate for component separation is challenging and often sort of depends on the experience and the training of the surgeons. What you bring to bear and what the patient brings to you. I mean in general the indications for a component separation really include any defect that can't be closed primarily without undue tension. And so there's clearly some judgment that's necessary in that case. Um, certain people have certain cutoffs in diameter of size or in square centimeters of size. And so it's, it's difficult to say what, what one hernia will require component separation in one person's hands. The other person may not feel the same. And so we do know though that in large patients with um, significant loss of domain, where a primary closure is either impossible or would result in significant tension that component separation is really necessary to close that abdominal wall. Um, and there are various techniques to do that. So some surgeons can favor an open anterior component separation technique, also um, favored or termed the Ramirez technique as he was the first plastic surgeon to describe it um, in the literature. Other surgeons might use an endoscopic component separation technique to try to lower morbidity associated with creating big subcutaneous skin flaps that are necessary in the anterior component separation. And, and still others will use a posterior component separation technique. It's a bit newer. Um, it's well proved and it's called the transversus abdominis release technique. Mm -hmm. So there are pros and cons to each of those. Okay. And are there, are there some areas of hot controversy in, in, in which um, which sorts of uh, hernias we should or shouldn't be using component separation? Sure. Well, you know, there are pros and cons to each technique, and really the hernia specialist or herniologist or, or the surgeon that's ultimately going to do these should be well versed in, in all the various approaches because not every patient fits nicely into one category or the other. We can't always say this is an anterior release patient and this is a posterior release patient. Sometimes it's a game time decision even with all the appropriate preoperative planning such as CT scans or MRIs or what have you. Mm -hmm. 
So for me personally, in my complex hernia practice, I deal with patients who have already had one or maybe even two types of component separation. They've developed a hernia recurrence or patients with multiple previous hernia repairs with loss of abdominal domain, with previous indwelling mesh of various types. And so in these complex patients, uh, a combination approaches may be necessary to ultimately close that abdomen. And it may even take several operations in some of them to accomplish that goal. Mm -hmm. So some of the hot topics really um, are besides which surgeon does the approach, um, in large part general surgeons now are doing a lot more of these component separations than perhaps they did in the past when plastic surgery tend to do more of them. Um, so there's been a bit of a shift in, in who's doing more and more of these types of um, muscle advancement flaps, if you will. Uh, in addition, um, there's always been an ongoing body of research and it's always a hot topic of what mesh to put where. So um, whether it be a lightweight polypropylene or a heavyweight polypropylene or a polyester or a biologic graft, what mesh ultimately works best in what patient and in what location in the abdominal wall. And so that's a big ongoing sure. discussion. Sure. Also sounds like good stuff to spin off for another for another day. Yeah. Um, so what about uh, anything else that comes to mind about component separation for um, uh, what else does the average sure. general surgeon need to know about it? So really, I mean, there are some really good advantages of the component separation. Um, you know, once you have the technical skill set to do it, and it's, and it's pretty pretty straightforward if, if, if you learn it and, and gain experience. Um, for me, particularly the posterior approach of the transversus abdominis release really avoids the morbidity associated with subcutaneous flaps and, and permits retromuscular prepared neal placement of large pieces of mesh. We sometimes sew 30 by 30 pieces of mesh together um, or more in order to reinforce the defect. And then um, putting the mesh in the retrorectus prepared neal space really allows that mesh tissue interface neovascularization and tissue ingrowth that we really want, um, whether it be a piece of plastic mesh or a piece of biologic graft. Uh -huh. And the whole goal behind it is to really permit the significant displacement of tension from the midline closure, like we talked about earlier, to that mesh implant. And you're transmitting that tension through the graft or mesh to the lateral abdominal wall, taking it off the midline in the hopes that you won't develop a recurrence with that reinforcement technique. Mm -hmm. And. Uh do you sometimes have to reinforce uh, the lateral abdominal wall where you've done the releases? Yeah, so we have had patients that have had anterior component releases before, um, either done um, early in somebody's learning experience perhaps, or just due to patient factors uh, or other technical factors, and they develop a, her a hernia recurrence at the site of the anterior component separation. Mm -hmm. um, those are particularly difficult to fix and really should be done by someone who's done them before and has experience with the component separation techniques because oftentimes those patients do need a, a, um, a TAR or a transversus abdominis release and those can be quite challenging in patients who've already had an anterior release. And so um, that's sort of a newer area of research and study as to what the outcomes of those particular patients are as we see more and more patients with anterior component releases done. Um, in ways that may have not been the most appropriate or perhaps in the patient that's the most appropriate. And so um, we are fixing some of those now mm -hmm. um, with a different posterior approach. Gotcha. Okay. Last words on component separation? Um, yeah, I think it's, it's a growing um, tool that we can use for these complex hernia patients. Um, I think you're going to see more use of it as long as that use is done through appropriate education and it's not uh, simply watching a YouTube video and trying it one morning. Um, I think with the appropriate education and the appropriate experience, patients can have really, really good outcomes with these component separation techniques and allow us to close hernias that we maybe not have been able to close successfully before. Sounds promising. And we're getting data. Yeah, exactly. And, and I would encourage those who, who utilize these techniques to participate in the American Hernia Society Quality Collaborative because you can compare your outcomes with your neighbor's outcomes um, and also compare it to those uh, published results that you see in the literature. Great. Well, thanks for your time, Dr. J.B. Bittner. Sure, thank you. Take care. Thanks for checking out the Op Report. Help us keep conversations alive on topics in general surgery. Check out more episodes of the Op Report and other on-search content here at YouTube, 
find us at Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and find our homepage at OnSurge.com. Join the conversation and tell us what topics you'd like to hear about and what people you'd like to hear from.